All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. And we have a full agenda here. So I um, will go ahead. I, yep, we have got everyone. So hello, my name is Jen and I work with the OpenDDS team in the OpenDDS Foundation. And we are pleased to have a full panel with us here today. So from OCI, we have Adam Mitz, Tim Simpson, Justin Wilson, and Fred Hornsey with us. And our special guest from Leonardo DRS, we have David James. So thank you guys for being here with us. And thank you all for joining us for our first Open DDS Town Hall webinar. Uh, so what we're going to do to, for you today is we are going to give you the most up-to-date um, information on Open DDS, Open DDS Foundation, uh, upcoming events. DJ is going to give us uh, a briefing on a case study where he's worked with um, OCI and Open DDS over at DRS and we're going to get a status update and then we are going to do a live Q&A at the end with and answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So if you would please go ahead and load up your questions into the Q&A and we will get to those as many as we can at the end. So with that we will go ahead and get started. So as far as upcoming events we have several training events coming up here in May. As you can see here, we've got an introduction to OpenDDS, building OpenDDS applications with DDS security, OpenDDS Essentials, and OpenDDS Essentials 2. So we look forward to seeing all of you in those. And then as far as um, the OpenDDS Foundation. So for those of you who are not aware, we recently established the OpenDDS Foundation, and that's a non-for-profit foundation that is we've established to support the OpenDDS project. And we're really excited about this. Um, it is, we have a technology advisory board that um, is, is, part we have um a nice group of folks that um meets regularly to help steward the foundation and um meets to uh discuss and help recommend um pro the project's roadmap and provide technical direction um so we've got folks from all over members from plot, plot logic u.s navy Washington University, Remedy IT. So as you can see, members from um, all different technology backgrounds and, and a, a nice diverse group and um, uh, um, work, work background. So um, we're really excited, like I said, about um, the foundation and being able to um, watch it grow and um, help um, help support the open dds project um is also with the foundation um part of that is evangelizing open dds so we have um the technical training that the, the foundation supports technical webinars um the foundation does a lot of providing the on-demand content um, the social media, um, helping support different things like um, per doing case studies, um, posting articles and things like that. Um, one of the other things that we definitely like to make sure that we always help promote is along with the, the social media and, and participation in community events is to definitely help promote um, uh, submitting issues and contributing to the project. Um, and so uh, the link isn't there, but definitely um, if you, once after we post this, um, you'll see the slides, but in that questions here is a link to GitHub discussions and you'll see at the end of the slides, um, links to resources and it's a link to the GitHub project. So like us on GitHub and go to the project and um, and definitely uh, we, we like to see contributions from the community. So um, definitely um, interested in, in community 
um, feedback there. So additionally, um, one of the other um, things that we like with the with the foundation and and part of the support with the foundation is the um, the contributions from our sponsors. So as a non for profit, the Open DDS Foundation relies on the financial support of our contributing members, and we are um, very appreciative of the donations that we already have. Um, there's a link to to those right there. So thank you to the, the folks that have already uh, sponsored. And um, we have a link here for corporate sponsorship if you're interested in learning more about that and becoming a corporate sponsor, as well as a community member sponsorship. There's information there. Um, so again, thank you to those who have already sponsored. We appreciate that. And if you're interested in learning more, you can go to those links and learn more about it. Or um, there, like I said, at the end, there are information links, um, and please definitely reach out to us. We would be interested in talking with you and, um, and helping you learn more. Um, so we're, we're here, to, here to help. We've got information, we've got resources. So, um, I think that that is it for me. I think that that might be my last slide. Um, and. Yes, and the, one of the interesting things here um, is is DJ, and he's going to give give you all um, a nice briefing on um, DDS and and what uh, we've done with them at, at DRS. So, DJ, I'm going to pass that over to you. Thanks, Jen. So, my name is David James. Everybody calls me DJ. I'm the uh, technical director for software engineering here at Land Systems. I've been in the role for uh, probably about three years and had the title for about one year. Uh, one of the things that we have is we have closed restricted networks with, within a vehicle. And we have the communications between all of those different machines and applications within our closed restricted network in the vehicle. So the network will contain and does contain sensors and that information from those sensors needs to be disseminated to all the other applications for display and decision making. And this is part of our uh, battlefield situational awareness suite. One of the things that we have had issues with in the past is getting all of those pieces of software to talk to each other. But getting that communication is key and for this program we're using some software from a third party that, that's actually uh kind of i'm, I'm going to say uh expected of us to use and that piece of software is already using dds but it's rti dds so our previous technical director had started to move toward open source and several of our software engineers at the time of which i was one advocated going to open source software. OCI being a local company and OpenDDS being open source, it just seemed like it was a natural fit for us to do this, especially with the interoperability with RTI's DDS. We'd previously used a piece of software that used a pub sub with callbacks within Java. And without the IDL, this was cumbersome to define new information that needed to be passed. With DDS, though, we were able to get the IDL to help us in that regard. And I know that some of the OCI folks on the call here helped in that definition. And that was extremely helpful, and it made us uh, more productive in that regard. So with DDS having its multicast capability, as opposed to having those callbacks, that what helped us with our network management too. We've been using OpenDDS on this program as our comm backbone, and it's running with several different applications on the vehicle network. And all between OpenDDS on our side, RTI DDS on the other side, and OpenDDS within our own applications, making certain that the information is delivered in a timely manner. So one of our biggest challenges was the interoperability between 
the implementations of RTI and OpenDDS. But we had OCI folks here on site helping with the implementation and then any issues being able to reach back to OCI, those, those issues were addressed quickly. In fact, we had an issue um, late last fall and we had a person on site from OCI to determine the cause, create a patch and have that patch delivered to us all within a week. So having OCI in town, close at hand, expertise, helped tremendously. And we've delivered releases of our application to our customer for a complete system. One of our software engineers has traveled to the demonstrations and the customer has been very happy with the results. Thank you so much, DJ. That is so awesome to hear. I do have a link um, on this slide to the case study that we wrote up with you, um, which, which is just so awesome. And um, hopefully we do have, we will have some, some questions for you at the end um, that, that folks will want to ask. And um, everything that you said is, is just wonderful to hear. And we just really like to get that feedback and we're really glad to work with you. And we did some, did some great things and, and hope for more of that. So thank you again. Adam, I think that you are up next. All right, thank you, Jen, and thank you again, DJ. This is Adam Mitz speaking now, and I am going to just give you a very high-level uh, overview of what the overall OpenDDS community accomplished in, in 2021 in terms of releasing new versions of, uh, of the code. And then I'm going to pretty quickly turn it over to other team members who will talk about some of the uh, highlight features, you know, in, in particular. But um, things that were accomplished in the year that, uh, that just passed. So in terms of you know, actually getting new releases of OpenDDS uh, done, we had four minor releases and two point releases in, in the calendar year. So we, we kicked off uh, 2021 back in, the, in January of last year by releasing the 3.16 version was the first to support X types. So uh, there is a whole nother webinar on that that's in our, our back catalog if you'd like to uh, see the video of that. But uh, X-Types is a, a large specification from the object management group all about the uh, type system in DDS and how types and schema are communicated between processes, how uh, topics can have readers and writers of slightly different but compatible types, and just kind of formalizing how all that works. That's a a major milestone in uh, OpenDDS's evolution. Then we had the 3.17 release in May, uh, had some features for JSON that we'll talk about in a little bit, and some uh, features for logging details of the message level um, in our TPS. If 3.18 happened last August, uh, we uh, added support for IDL4 extended integer types, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a while, and kind of continued uh, with the you know RTPS focused performance and scalability improvements, which which really isn't one thing, right? But it's uh, like a lot of other uh, performance things, more of a uh, you know a, a journey that uh, that that keeps getting better in in successive releases. Uh, we did also have these point releases, just shown here, kind of on the timeline, and we released three point nineteen in uh, you know, last December, and that adds the first dynamic types features from the X type spec. So that's just a very broad overview. I didn't wanna leave out that you know, since uh, some time has passed now, we have just last week released the 3.20 um, version. So that, that is the current uh, OpenDDS. And as you see these uh, four releases, the 16, 17, 18, 19, and even the fifth one in 20, kind of fall into different calendar quarters. Uh, so the plan is to continue with that. Uh, lots more details are available on uh, GitHub and uh, they will be available to you in the next uh, bunch of slides because I will turn it over to other uh, members of the team. Thanks, Adam. I'm Fred Hornsey. I'm going to talk about some of OpenDDS's features that help provide Internet of Things solutions. In addition to um, the local network communications that OpenDDS 
provides. Um, and also, we also strive to um, connect iOS and Android mobile users to edge devices, either when they're at home or over the internet. For Android particularly, we've done a, a couple of improvements over the last year, and this includes uh, support for Android API level 30. Uh, Google made some changes in um, some security related changes relating to how we can access uh, detecting network interface changes, and we've made an update to uh, comply with that. Silver lining in that is, in addition to being able to support these newer devices, is that um, we have a template to be able to use the Android Java API in the future if we want to or need to. We also extended ACEDAO, which we use for platform um, abstraction and as a build system, to um, be able to use the Android NDK directly. And that saves the time of having to generate and use a what's called a standalone uh, tool chain, which Google is moving and Android away from for the most part. And then uh, on the internet part of things specifically, um, we have a program called uh, RTPS Relay that helps um, these edge users, such as mobile users, be able to connect to other devices on the internet even if they're not on the local network, so that we can uh, make use of them. And we've made many stability and performance improvements. And these are things like um, being able to tell how how much uh, load is on the relay, be able to respond to that. And then we've also, uh, Tim will talk about this more, but we've also added about the ability to keep tabs on how the relay is performing performance-wise in our bench framework. And then on our language support front, OpenDDS tries to provide support for several languages and whatever the developer is using. Built into OpenDDS, we have support for C++, both a um, traditional C++03 based mapping and a C++11 based mapping. For both of those, we've added um, the explicit integer types that Adam mentioned. The What this is, is um, instead of saying octet or say unsigned long in the IDL, you can say um, int8 and u int32, which is uh, nice. And those things will appear as the respective types in the C++ mapping. And then uh, we've also made it possible to use uh, IDL and C++ keywords. There are some special rules about that, of course, but it's now possible. And then we've made many small improvements to the C++ 11 mapping and continue to work on anonymous type support, which is where you have to use a, where you don't have to use a type def for like a sequence, things like that. And then for Java, it also got um, support for explicit integer types and then some um, minor memory improvements for the underlying generated code to better support large data structures. And those are the built-in language support features for um, OpenDDS. External projects uh, extend it to other uh, languages. First, we have uh, JavaScript. Uh, we've continued to update Node OpenDDS to support recent OpenDDS releases. I also believe we've updated it for recent node releases. And then we've also migrated the CI from uh, Travis to GitHub Actions, which we're using uh, other places. So that makes things more efficient. For PyOpenDDS, uh, there is quite a bit of work. Um, it's also been updated for recent OpenDDS releases and Python releases. And then it's gotten uh, Windows and Mac OS support because before it was only Linux. And as part of that, we made some improvements to how uh, it's built and tested. And then uh, thanks to an external contribution, this hasn't made it to release yet, but work has begun on supporting publishing basic WAS and more IDL types. And then finally for, um, uh, C-sharp, 
Um, this is a project that ex is not managed by OCI, but does get uh, regular updates, and we've tried it, our, tried it out ourselves. Uh, is uh, open DDS Sharp, and um, as far as we can tell, it's it's been updated to recent Open DDS releases, and it's also been updated to be able to support macOS and the latest Visual Studio. And with that, I think I can hand it over to Tim. Thanks. So I'm Tim Simpson. Um, I'll be talking about some of our changes in CI and just our general use of development tools. We've been doing a lot of work uh, over the past year plus to uh, improve the stability and performance of OpenDDS. And sort of in order to understand how far we've come, it's good to know where we started from. So at the end of 2020, we were uh, in a place where we were, were pretty heavily dependent on our own internal build farm to gauge readiness for release. And that's, that's still partially true, but we've added a number of additional measures to ensure we don't have as many unexpected issues uh, to resolve before release. And that's helped us to uh, improve our release cadence. So we, we're, we're, you know, we're aiming for uh, quarterly really releases, and this has helped us to, to be on time. So previously we had some support for builds as part of our continual integration process. Um, primarily we were using a, a, a cloud hosted Jenkins based PR builder. Um, and we had some coverage for other types of builds, uh, either using Travis CI while it was available to us, as well as using Azure pipelines. And then after we merged, so post-merge after the CI was done, uh, then we would run everything through our internal build farm. But this often meant it was, you know, difficult to catch, you know, edge case compilation or test issues that were unique to kind of our lesser utilized platforms or specific OpenDDS configurations that, um, you know, had like uh, compile time flags that, you know, weren't covered by our, our CI process. And then we also had, you know, one of our, one of our build farms uh, had an VMs has an address sanitizer, but these address sanitizer issues we would never catch until after things had already been merged. Uh, we also had some coverage for uh, stress testing. Um, this and this was uh, done through our our, our bench framework, um, and we have uh, a performance dashboard website where you can look at the results of that. So that's where we came from. Um, so improvements since then, we've continued to improve the performance dashboard and bench overall. Um, you, we've got a link on this slide to our, you know, webinar that we did on bench in the, in the last year, in case you have questions about what that might look like, but we've been making a lot of changes kind of upfront and behind the scenes, you know, just general improvements to bench. We've made quite a bit of improvements to how the data is processed just to kind of, uh, improve the overall cycle time from merging code to the visible test results. So a lot of that used to be done with bash scripts and now there's actual C++ applications that are doing our, our, our data processing for us. We've also added a number more like test scenarios that are uh, run each time we check in code. Um, and this like most notably that uh, includes, like, we extended bench coverage to have parity with the performance web pages that are already on opendds.org. Um, just so we can continue to update those result pages with future versions. And we've also added coverage uh, for some of the non-local RTPS discovery mechanisms, such as the DCPS info repo uh, and the RTPS relay. So in addition to changes to, to bench and to the dashboard, um, we've basically moved our CI process fully over to GitHub Actions, um, and we've broadened our coverage in CI by quite a bit. Uh, so um, if you've ever submitted or gone and looked at the summary for uh, a PR in the last year, you'll have seen there are, this is the graphical view you can see in this slide, but there's a, you know, a maze of different jobs that gets built. Um, and that's partly because we separate, you know, the build steps for ASDAO and uh, OpenDDS and the test phases out into separate jobs just to kind of speed up uh, the CI process. Um, but we have, you know, there's over 30 plus build configurations that are being um, built. And then uh, on, you know, a number of different platforms that's, you know, Mac OS, uh, or at least there, there, there was and will be Mac OS support right now. It's, I think um, we've mitigated it a bit, but there's also coverage for Windows Server 16. And there's also coverage for, or there was, and then Windows Server 19, and now Windows Server 22. Um, and then in addition to Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu uh, 20. 
and then 22 of those different configurations uh, include some form of a test suite. It may not be the full test suite, but it's at least partial. Um, there are several that run the full test suite though. And then we also have in CI now, we have uh, an address sanitizer and a thread sanitizer build. Um, the address sanitizer runs the full test suite, but the thread sanitizer is partial as we work to try and make more and more of our, our test suite uh, compatible with it. And then lastly, um, we've added an intentional unit test coverage report. Um, and we already had fairly good coverage of our top level APIs using our integration test suite and our, our stress tests, but we wanted to improve our coverage for unit tests. Uh, since they had always um, been lagging behind, just kind of due to the interconnected nature of our components. And so this helps keep us uh, honest and responsible. And so we need to, you know, we, we recognize this is an area that we need to uh, improve. And so, you know, we've, we've now have visual, visual proof uh, of, of how far we've come. Uh, that's that's on, our, on our, our scoreboard webpage as well. Uh, and with that, I think I am handing back over to, I'm handing over to Justin. All right, thanks. So over the past year, a number of, of clients have sponsored features that involve uh, generating and capturing metadata for the purposes of logging, debugging, profiling, et cetera. Um, some of this is like accounting where I wanna see the messages that were produced and I wanna see the messages that were consumed. Um, so uh, this, this section is going to largely cover uh, some of those tools uh, and techniques. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the first one is that we um, produced a generic interface for uh, serializing and deserializing samples. Um, by itself, it's not very useful, um, but implementations of it make it useful. So OpenDDS, um, if you enable the rapid JSON support, uh, you will have access to a JSON value reader and JSON value writer. And with these, you can convert samples to and from JSON. Um, mostly these have been used for logging. Um, and I'll describe kind of where that, how they fit into the logging uh, part later. Uh, for a real live example, you can go look at the RTPS relay in the OpenDDS code base. Um, however, some, of, some users are, are reading seed data uh, stored as JSON to populate test applications. Um, it's a little bit easier than, than decoding XCDR. Um, since you can go in and edit it uh, a lot easier. Um, so we, we think that you know, other possibilities are out there. Um, if you want to explore XML encodings or, or other um, you know, uh, encodings that are out there, uh, or even serializing to and from a database, uh, that, that's also uh, possible. Um, there is a link to an article there where we describe uh, a little bit more about how JSON value reader and value writer uh, are used. So one of the things uh, that, that some clients wanted, uh, some users wanted, was the idea that um, I want to log kind of every sample as it's produced and every sample as it's consumed, including when it actually gets put into the reader cache, whether or not the reader takes it or reads it. Um, and if you attempt to do that um, completely at the application level, it ends up being a lot of logging code and it becomes very difficult to maintain. Um, it's, it's just very hard to do it in a generic way that kind of stays out of the way um, and, and, you know, is clean. So this kind of motivated uh, a thing that we call the observer interface, which provides this generic capability for monitoring samples as they pass through the DCPS layer. Basically, anytime a sample is written, read, uh, took, I'm using the wrong words here. I'm going to use the ones that are on the slide. Writing, reading, taking, uh, and then storing in the data reader. Uh, you can receive an event uh, with, with access to the actual um, data that, that was uh, in question, and then you can do something with it. Uh, typically, you're just going to log it or perhaps you know, store it somewhere uh, for, for uh, later. Um, the observer interface is very similar in concept to the spec defined listener. So listeners are hierarchical. You can install them at the participant, publisher, subscriber, or data reader, data writer level, um, and they roll up to where the, the most, uh, the closest listener in the chain uh, is the one that gets invoked. And you can also choose the events that you want, uh, writing, reading, taking, storing, uh, et cetera. Um, so with the observer, and the value writer, um, it's possible to log all sample activity with very little code. Um, you just install a, 
uh, observer uh, on a participant. Uh, you then, um, there's some helper methods for converting to JSON. Uh, you write it into your log and you're done. Um, this also works for built-in topics. So if you want to uh, monitor discovery, uh, what, what things uh, are um, kind of uh, out there on your network, you can also uh, use the observer with that. Uh, and again, there's the, the link to the article uh, uh, that uh, describes how you can do this. Uh, logging in DDS uh, is very organic. And what that means is you've had lots of different people over many years uh, kind of doing what they thought was right at the time. Uh, and there was no real organization behind it. Um, we have developed a logging standard for developers. Um, and the uh, main ideas here are that there's going to be log levels that are defined uh, first, the, the messages are, are separated as those that are intended for users and those that are intended for debugging. Uh, those that are intended for users have levels like error, warning, notice, and info um, that the, the user is obviously in control of. Um, and that's controlled by the DCPS log level. Uh, DCPS debug level, which probably many of you are familiar with, um, will eventually be phased out or reinterpreted. Uh, there's also the transport debug level will also be phased out or reinterpreted. Uh, what's going to happen is that we'll start introducing feature-specific flags that are going to control logging for different features. Um, one example of this that's been very useful and very good is the security-related logging. Um, so there's, I believe, around six different flags you can enable to see different aspects of security and how security is working to uh, facilitate debugging or, or introspection. In addition to this, we're, we're, we have uh, defined kind of standard log message formatting. Um, ideally, that will make processes that want to consume DDS logs in an automated way easier to write. Um, and we're not necessarily going to apply this all at once, uh, as that would be a monumental effort. But kind of as we touch different areas in the code, we'll, we'll uh, make these improvements. We've uh, added some extra built-in topics, uh, three. I'll talk about two on this slide. So the two on this slide are called participant location and connection record. And what they describe is network connectivity, um, specifically when you're using RTPS discovery and transport. Uh, when, you have, when you're using RTPS, you can be talking to somebody locally, meaning um, you, you uh, are on the same LAN and you can exchange messages directly. You could be using the RTPS relay um, and you're exchanging messages with it through that. Or you could be using a protocol called ICE, which stands for Internet Interactive Connectivity Establishment, um, which allows you to go from firewall to firewall. Um, so the, these two topics, or at least the participant location topic at this time, uh, will report how you're interacting with another participant. Um, and all three are possible, and all, actually six are possible because we support IPv4 and IPv6. Um, the readers for these are accessed like the other built-in topics. Um, we, we initially designed the participant location, um, and, and uh, a client used it for a while. Um, on retrospect, it's a bit clunky, and we'll probably eventually replace it with connection record, uh, which is a little bit more generic. Let's go to the next one. Uh, the last bit, uh, or another built, built in topic that we added is for uh, thread status. Um, so a client wanted the ability to uh, detect deadlocks and other uh, issues related to um, threads not behaving well. Um, so uh, there, we added support in OpenDDS to uh, update thread status, and then we exposed that via a built in topic. Um, each instance corresponds to a thread and um, they check in at some kind of monitoring interval. Um, the only caveat is if you want to use this and you write a, so a watchdog, you need to add some kind of safety factor. So if you're reporting at one second, you really need to uh, monitor at three seconds. Um, and again, the RTPS relay has an example uh, of this code. And just uh, in terms of kind of framing the future here, we've, we've used a variety of techniques to expose data to users that are outside of the spec. Um, the observer that we uh, interface that we created uh, works very well. Um, the extra bits are okay, but they're limited by the way DDS, the DDS spec defines bits, as in they have to belong to a subscriber and that subscriber has to belong to a participant and so on. 
Um, there's various polling APIs. There's a legacy statistics interface, which isn't maintained. There's a new transport statistics interface, which is the jury is out on that one. Um, moving forward, we would like to move away from polling APIs, kind of resolve the weaknesses and bits, but provide the some, same functionality. Uh, so thinking more along the lines of just a, a raw data reader uh, that is a, a sample cache with listener support so that we can um, expose data, interesting data to users that, that they need um, that, that is outside of, of what the DDS spec is providing. So in the X-Type spec, uh, created the ability to reflect on types and instances of that type. So um, we didn't implement all of X-Types initially, um, but we did implement uh, recently a new feature called dynamic data. And we have partial support for reading dynamic data. Um, so a reader can be created that um, is based on a, a topic, um, but not necessarily a type. So then it can receive uh, receive those, and then it can use an API to inspect uh, what members are available, what their types are, and then you can you can operate on the data uh, via an API. Um, and there's an article again that shows uh, kind of shows off the uh, the support that we have for dynamic data. And with dynamic data, there is a new utility uh, in tools and spec that, that uses it, um, takes topic name, a type name, and a domain ID, um, and then it logs samples written to that topic to the console. So um, what we expect moving forward is really a transition from these kind of pre-X types tools like recorder to replayer to kind of X types dynamic data powered tools like inspect. Um, thinking about things like um, being able to um, have a, a log essentially that gets replayed um, and uh, on the flip side, a, a generic tool that allows you to kind of inspect what's going on in the domain and record uh, information or inspect uh, topics of various types without uh, knowing the IDL for them. Okay, next one. And I will hand it over to Adam. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, everybody. So I thought we would wrap up this section of uh, the webinar today with uh, kind of looking ahead uh, what the what the team, the, the the larger team, right? Not not just the folks you heard today, but uh, those that are participating in the technology advisory board and um, others are thinking about a, a little bit further into the future when thinking of what a version four might want to do. Um, High-level goals include improving the initial user experience, you know, making it easier for someone to, uh, you know, configure and build and get running quickly with what they need. Uh, make it easier to extend OpenDDS for your own particular needs and to contribute code. Um, I think those are related, right? Because uh, certain kinds of extensions might want to be contributed back into the repository. Going to a new major version uh, just allows us the chance to do kind of the normal maintenance sorts of things that happen in, in projects that have been around for a long time, like removing superseded features uh, like these separate UDP and multicast transports, right? We have the RTPS UDP transport, which is capable of all these things um, already, right? Uh, unicast and multicast traffic over UDP, V4 and V6, and just kind of centralizing RTPS kind of in the design, right? That the out-of-the-box default behavior of the system should be to have RTPS discovery and RTPS transport, right? That gives you access to all the new features like the X-Types features, uh, DDS security, and interoperability um, that, that DJ was mentioning. Not that other options aren't going to be available for discovery and transport, but just having that as the default and kind of the, the way that, that we're doing some of the internal uh, types in OpenDDS that way as well. Uh, it's a chance to update kind of the minimum supported compiler versions, dependencies, et cetera. And uh, we want to look at kind of the continued uh, decoupling from DAO. And this is not to, to minimize DAO or to say that DAO is not good. It is. It's a very good solution for what it does. And, you know, we continue to, to support uh, DAO as a uh, separate open source project. But this is just part of the kind of the history of OpenDDS, right? OpenDDS, in a sense, started as an extension uh, to DAO and then evolved as a separate project. Earlier versions of OpenDDS 
you know, required DAO for communication with a centralized discovery server, which is called DCPS Info Repo. Uh, today, DCPS Info Repo is optional. So no communication that, uh, that an open DDS process is doing actually flows through DAO unless you need it, right? Unless you've decided to use DCPS Info Repo. Uh, but we do still have dependencies on the DAO uh, libraries um, that, that are used for various uh, kind of supporting features. So we would uh, kind of plan on and expect for V4 to kind of continue that, uh, that decoupling. So it's up to you as a user, if you want to use you know, DAO as well as OpenDDS within a process that will be Definitely possible and uh, supported for anyone wanting to do the uh, you know RPC style uh, efficient um, you know request reply to uh, help build distributed applications that way and let Open DDS you know focus on on the DDS things right on the uh, efficiently publish and subscribe uh, to uh, to share cache data across distributed applications and and do all the things uh, that makes uh, Open DDS. Uh, a DDS. So that that is uh, you know fairly high level. Uh, if anyone is interested in in more detail, we can I'll probably discuss offline as well. But we do have some time for Q and A. So I see Steve has a question of me. Oh yeah, okay, go ahead. I can so, I, I can ask that so, question uh, for you on the uh, on the audio. So Steve was sure. asking how seamless was the effort to achieve interoperability between RTI, DDS, and OpenDDS? Actually, it was uh, very easy. Once we had the IDL down between us, there was essentially no interoperability problems. In fact, the, the, the latest issue we found has been with RTI. So from, from the open side, I think, like I said, we had one issue, but it was all internal last fall. And with the OCI person coming on site, it was great. Thanks, DJ. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. There was a question on build system. I would say maybe the, the easiest way to address build system would be to say not really decided yet. I think that there might be a good opportunity if people have particular ideas there to use the discussions tab in GitHub uh, as a way to kind of exchange notes and previous experiences um, and build systems. Um, I have at least heard of of Mason or Mison, however we pronounce that, um, before. So definitely an interesting one. Uh, there was also a question on discovery pluggability. So I guess the concept there would be if you want to do discovery in a different way. And Justin, I can throw that to you if you'd like. Sure. Uh, yes. So one of the ideas in terms of making DDS easier to contribute to is going to be changing some of the internal interfaces and contracts uh, that, that are needed. Um, so most of you that, that are using OpenDDS realize that there's, uh, there are discoveries and there are transports and there are discoveries that use transports. In general, there's some, there's some tight coupling that we want to get rid of. And by reducing that internal coupling, uh, coupling um, that'll make it a lot easier for new discoveries to be made and I don't sorry new, <laughs> you get what I'm saying uh, new discovery modules if you will to be plugged in um, ideally that'll also make it easier to uh, create transports so a number of users um, like you know like the idea of writing a custom transport um, especially on uh, if they have you know, specialized hardware uh, or, you know, special networks that, that can take advantage of it. Um, but it is, uh, the transport code is a little gnarly. So one of the, the long-term goals for either four, you know, starting before, during, or after four will be to adjust some of those things so that it's a lot easier to extend it for your own discovery or your own transport. Thanks, Justin, and thanks uh, everyone who asked questions. Um, I would add on to that the idea as we're kind of talking about the the version four sort of uh, the concepts there. Uh, as Justin was just mentioning, it's not 
necessarily true that you know every single improvement we're talking about here has to like wait for a new major version. It might not, right? So we are certainly open to you know uh, continuing to you know support and extend version three. I mean that's that's all that exists right now um, into the future. Uh, but you know in general, uh, no matter which particular version, right? We want to make sure OpenDDS is uh, you know useful in lots of different scenarios uh, for, for the user community and uh, to enable contributions of many different types. Uh, any other questions? If not, um, I wanna thank everyone for your time this morning. Uh, we will uh, make slides and recording available and uh, please feel free to, to contact us. I'll put the, the Let's Connect slide back up there's many different ways to do that, um, but OpenDDS.org is the main website of the OpenDDS project, and um, obviously the GitHub repository is where the uh, uh, you know code uh, happens, including the CI that that Tim mentioned before, uh, GitHub discussions, pull requests, and all those things. So thanks everyone. Have a good day. Thanks for hosting. Thank you, DJ.